In recent years, humanitarian responses have been complicated by compounding crises, such as climate change, epidemics and pandemics, and complex conflicts. In an ever-changing humanitarian and development space, we ask, what does the security and safety of aid workers look like? And what might it look like in the future? I'm Tara Arthur from the Global Interagency Security Forum. In each episode, I'll be speaking to guests about topics such as the localization of aid, the ups and downs of community acceptance, and the role of security in a digital world. Join me as we unpack the evolutions of NGO security risk management. Welcome, Ziad. It's nice to see you here today. It's nice to see you too, Tara. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to today's episode for many reasons, but maybe before we get to that, you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the sector. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. So first of all, hi, my name is Ziad El Ashkar and I um, currently wear a couple of hats. I'm a PhD candidate at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution, where I'm putting the final touches on my dissertation, which looks into how humanitarian organizations, peace building organizations, use and utilize technology as part of the work that they do and how they pursue this notion of legibility that not to go into academic details, but how they use technology to, to implement programs and pitfalls and risks that come with that at the times. And then my other hat is that I do research on collecting and curating evidence of what works and what doesn't to prevent and stop conflict and promote peace as part of the work that I do. I got involved with a sector back in 2000, probably 11 is when I really got involved with this. I started work with, at the time, the Sally Sentinel Project, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative was a part of. And the goal was to look into ways using satellite imagery and curating of other resources to potentially prevent and kind of act as a deterrent for potential violence that might erupt on the border region between Sudan and South Sudan. At the time, South Sudan or the people living in Southern Sudan were about to vote on a referendum in which they overwhelmingly decide they're going to secede from uh, Sudan and establish their own nation. And there was a lot of concerns that there might be a return to hostilities and violence. And so a consortium of organizations came together and thought, well, if we can use, you know, high resolution satellite imagery, maybe we could track potential, you know, nefarious activities and potential military buildups and we could warn the world. And maybe by warning the world and being this like very public tool, public megaphone, that we could prevent any hostilities of happening, any return to violence. Unfortunately, history tells us that events unfolded and there was a return of clashes and a lot of violence in the border regions. And what started as a kind of an early warning system became real quickly a system to document atrocities and human rights violations. And so I did this work for a while. And the team that I was working on, we quickly realized, well, technology is amazing. This new tool is acceptable to us as like the public sector, not just, you know, government and intelligence organizations. And it was also the time where, you know, we had a lot more access to new technology. You know, smartphones were becoming a thing. And connectivity was increasing. The world was getting connected. We really started thinking about data and, and issues of digital tools as how they relate more to the work of humanitarians and aid workers, peace builders were doing quickly realizing this is both really powerful and potentially democratizing and and has a lot of potential for for good, but also there's a lot of risks and a lot of harms that could come out of doing this work in a not professional way, not standardized way. If we don't have guidelines and how do we follow kind of the humanitarian principles to do this kind of work. And so that's kind of how I got involved in in, in this field back in 2011 and onward is I've just been on this trajectory of going in and out of academia to do a graduate degree and now a PhD, but also maintaining kind of the goal of how do you do this work? How can we learn from research and what's being done to help practitioners, which is why I'm excited to be on this podcast and talk to you today. What a great background and exactly why we wanted to have this moment to speak with you. And maybe you can ground us with that great background in a couple of questions. So, you know, we talk a lot about technology and maybe you can guide us into how we might define technology And then additionally, in terms of, you know, the humanitarian sector, what do you see as kind of the most important areas or, you know, trending technologies from your vantage point that we should be keeping aware of? Again, excellent question. I think how do we define technology is a very big question. And the reason I say that 
is that from an academic standpoint, we don't have an agreed upon necessarily definition of what technology is, right? So if you look into like the literature of people who study this stuff, you're going to come across dozens of, I don't say competing definitions, but at least definitions that are a little bit different. But what normally you come across is kind of, I think, three broad categories of things that define what technology is. And then the specific technology might focus on one thing. And so the three things are technology, first and foremost, is about tools. It's about kind of tangible things or it's the intangible like software that gets developed. The second thing that kind of, I think, cuts across most definitions that I've seen from my work and research is that technology is about the knowledge, the know-how also. And so how do you use the tools and, and the knowledge of how they operate? And then, But also, I think the key thing that I come back to is that technology is always purposeful meaning that it's not just a thing, it's the thing that you use to achieve something. And so I think when we think about technology, we got to think of it as there are a set of tools, whether they're kind of the hardware or the software or a combination of both. There's a set of knowledge that as an individual or organizations you build up over time about those tools. And then their goal of the technology is what do you do with it? And so whether it's applied to security risk management or if it's applied to medical procedures, right? It's how you use a specific technology, whether it's collecting a survey about a needs in Beirut, Lebanon, or it's about survey for shopping desires of somebody in Arlington, Virginia, right? So it's about how you apply the technology. So as it relates, I think, to the humanitarian sector, Tara, to your question about what is exciting, what is kind of up and coming, I think there's quite a few things and I'll kind of hit on them and then we can go if you want into more details. I think one of the more sure. exciting things that the sector has been doing, and I think at least in the last, I say five to seven years, it's been this increased reliance on mobile banking and cash aid as kind of this new innovation and new technology that's been increasingly used by humanitarian and aid organizations, right? So it's left mm-hmm. about how do we get things to people and more how do we get money to people in their whether it's through mobile banking or direct cash giving or a combination of all of these things, because people then could use them and it's, it's much more helpful, especially if the markets exist for them to go buy things. And so that's been a very exciting development. And I think the role of technology is being explored more and more into it, right? Like how do you design systems that are safe, that are easy to use, user-friendly? Other forms, you know, there's been a lot more discussion. I think for me, that's been exciting is I started my career on satellite imagery and remote sensing in just about 10 years. The technology both exploded in a sense of there's a lot more providers and it's gotten a lot cheaper, but also the quality and kind of your refresh rate, how often you get the imagery has gone from like, you know, you might have to wait a few days to, you know, you can just order right now on my cell phone an image of where I am. You can do it basically for anywhere around the world. Yeah, I'm wondering if maybe you could go into a little bit about remote sensing just for people who may not be as familiar I think it's a great tool for sure. And I'm sure there's some applicable uses that our audience might be interested in. Yeah, of course. So remote sensing, you can understand it as kind of what are kind of different set of tools that are collecting and and information remotely and they're constantly collecting data. And so it could be something like drone imagery. It could be kind of a sensor cameras placed around cities that are collecting data, or it could be salad imagery that's being used, other kind of sensors that's used for like weather, for example collecting weather data or sensing for like um, agricultural output. And so there's like different components to it. It's kind of a broad term for kind of technology that collects information about a specific event or specific situation. And one of the things, you know, you'll notice a lot of it sometimes feeds into kind of developing these more and more in-depth maps. We've kind of seen kind of crisis mapping go through cycles within the sector of like being really cool early 2000s and kind of like plateaued. And it's still very often used as part of kind of the first response to a disaster. And do you mind repeating the second part of the question? Because I feel like I've lost. Yeah, no, you've actually answered it really well. And I think basically the idea is to understand a bit from your vantage point, being more on the tech side, what are these types of technologies that are most trend setting or the ones that we should be most attentive to in the humanitarian sector? And bonus would be for our security colleagues, yeah. where is this? conversation around technology going and what are the tools, you know, like remote sensing, for example, and some of the applicability that you foresee being useful to the sector? Yeah, I'll add one that I think is particularly relevant to the security folks and kind of, it's new in a sense, but not necessarily very new, but it's it's the notion of in a humanitarian sector, they're called humanitarian notification systems. And this is where I think technology is playing an interesting role. And humanitarian notification systems are part of like what they call decompliction 
right? It's about notifying armed actors that these are kind of non-targetable areas. These are humanitarian, could be facilities. One good thing is we actually have an episode on humanitarian notification systems, so this is a perfect plug for it. Oh, awesome. It, <laughs> that episode definitely will walk us through the ins and outs of HNS or humanitarian notification systems. So that's amazing to hear that from you. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And then I think the last real thing about when I think especially for security, for security officials and security professionals and people who work in this field, and I think what's been exciting and it's less so about the technology, like a new technology. I think there's more guidance nowadays about technology use and kind of how you do this in a more safer way. How do you do this in a way that encompasses not just like your security team, but how do you include like everybody else in your organization? And so I think we've seen an improvement, at least over the last 10 years, of kind of the knowledge about technology, the kind of limitations, you know, learning how. For example, that in some places, you know, a low tech solution is probably the best way to go versus something with high tech and learning about the limitations of some tools where, you know, you might require 24 seven electricity and, and, and high bandwidth to be able to transmit these large data files. But, you know, there are solutions that might be low tech or very low tech in some cases. So I think we've improved as a sector. I think this has been kind of an exciting move is that we have more and more of these conversations and more organizations who are engage in this work and, and kind of sharing knowledge. And so I think that's also been a very exciting development in the sector. And That's great. I also, I think this is a good moment for us to kind of talk a little bit about some of the work you've also done previously on technologies and issues like acceptance. And I'm just wondering if maybe you can take us down that trajectory a little bit on you know, some of the practical uses of tech integrated into some of the common practices that we see in the humanitarian security side of things. So where do you see the interplay in some of the relationship dynamics between humanitarian security risk management and technologies, acceptance, et cetera? That's a big, big issue. And I'm glad you bring up the notion of acceptance because I think one of the key things that has increasingly come to play in the last few years is this notion of acceptance largely driven by, unfortunately, kind of the increase of kind of mis- and disinformation that brings new risks to security workers, to aid workers, because unfortunately nowadays it's gotten a lot easier for nefarious actors to engage in this kind of work. And so when we think about acceptance, we have to also think, you know, from a, you put like our SRM hat on is think about it, okay, is this kind of impacting the safety and security of our officers? Deploying or using a specific technology in an area might not be kind of the safest thing or that you ought to know that your reputation travels a lot faster nowadays, right? If you are ex organization, if there's been a bad moment or something bad happened with your organization in, in Lebanon, you know, people in, in Rwanda might know about this, right? So acceptance, it travels a lot quicker. It's international and technology plays a big role. And that on the notion of also coming back to this, this and misinformation, it's important for our security, our security officials, the security kind of risk managers to understand that, you know, there are things to be done and to make use of technology in a positive way, right? So we don't have to shy away from being maybe a little bit engaged on, on how these tools are used. So you can combat misinformation by engaging with local populations, engaging with groups that you want to work with, having more of, of conversations rather than kind of a one way approach that unfortunately a lot of times happens in the humanitarian sector. And so I think when it comes to acceptance and how we think about technology, how it impacts kind of this dynamic for like the SRM folks and the humanitarian folks, I think it goes back to, we got to remember at the end of the day, this is people talking to people and people working with people. And that the technology is really just a tool and it's kind of maybe a mechanism to kind of improve our ability to do things. And so we have to, I think, bring it back to kind of, okay, how do we improve kind of the human to human interactions and human human acceptance. At the end of the day, your reputation and who you are and, and kind of the relationships that you're able to build from a human to human level, from an organization to organization level, those play a huge role. And technology can't really do that for you, right? It's not a, I can't become more reputable or I can't become more known as kind of a, an honest broker or a, you name it because of using like Palantir or like a data software thing or using style of imagery. It's about how do you interact with the people that you're looking to work with. And so I think that's the importance that when we think about technology and when we think about acceptance is to think about well, how are we building relationships with people? How are we communicating with people 
why are we using, you know, a survey tool to collect all this information about them? And I think setting those as kind of the basis, you know, how you kind of set the scene for what type of technology you're going to use or why you're operating in a specific environment. It goes back to having honest conversations with people and getting their feedback, getting their buy-in, getting them involved to the degree possible with your decisions and what you're doing and kind of what the technology that you're going to use. If it's for survey, you know, why are you collecting all this information? Planning? What's the purpose of, you know, asking them 50 questions and how that's going to impact your ability to work in this area or provide specific aid? Or So I think it goes back really to human to human engagement. That is so well said. I think that human to human engagement is absolutely key. I want to build a little bit on what you're saying there and, and taking that forward especially if we bring this conversation to some of the everyday work that some of our members in particular might be facing, building relationships with IT and other parts of their organization. And I'm thinking from your particular standpoint and considering all that you've shared, you know, what are some ideas or suggestions you might bring for security experts, both physical and maybe even those who might straddle the fence both? What do you see as some important areas for that audience to understand, but also maybe some opportunities to better collaborate or improve collaborations? Sorry, that's a really good question. One of the things that my research has kind of come across is, is that we often think, especially on the humanitarian side, is that Security risks are just for the security team and cyber risks or digital risks are for the IT team where it's about kind of taking more of a holistic approach, right? So digital security, for example, yes, there are technical components to it that maybe it's the IT team that deals with it more directly, but it has impact throughout the organization, right? It's the person on the ground dealing with the community face-to-face to the person sitting at headquarters. Everybody kind of has a role to play. Everybody has to be more or less on the same page. And so I think what we need more of in this sector is less the siloing of kind of functions. Okay, this is like digital, this is security, this is, you know, X, Y, Z. It's it's, how do we think about things from a holistic standpoint? How do those things interact? Because they do, right? If you go back to this notion of acceptance, like every single component could have a negative impact on your acceptance. And it could happen, you know, whether it's digitally or it can happen like physically. And so the big thing that I come across is we need more and more conversations between the teams within organizations building kind of cross-functional capacities and training and, and frankly, it's sometimes building relationships better between the IT folks. If you have even an IT team, assume you're an organization that has an IT team, right? Good um, point. <laughs> and your security folks who are, it could be one person, right? Again, not assuming that I think a lot of organizations, you're, you might not even have those two and you're relying on like an external actor to provide those mm-hmm. things. I think the conversation is getting better, people realizing this. I think more and more there's work to kind of bridge the gap, to use kind of a cheesy sentence, between those different components of, of an organization. I think some of the better stuff is building the training tools, the teaching. Oftentimes the security guys are not necessarily, and girls are not necessarily the best trained in digital tools, right? They might be kind of a, an older generation, that's not the right term, but it might be kind of, they're not trained in these things. They're not necessarily meant to think about digital security. Or like, what is the physical security? How do we secure the transfer of a convoy? How do we secure it to staff? We're thinking about this much more from a digital, from a physical standpoint versus, well, there's huge elements of digital security that play a component that translates to a potential physical harm or could have a physical repercussions. And sometimes the two just because the way it kind of has been built up over decades, they don't necessarily interact as well. I think Breaking of siloing is naturally will happen with time, but I think whatever we can do to, to make it happen quicker and faster and more constructively, right? We don't want to just break silos for the sake of it. We want to make sense. Right. And, you know, there are things that the physical security folks do better than the, the IT folks won't be able to do or the admin folks. And so how do we bridge kind of these kind of different components of an organization is key. Let me ask you about that a little more because I think that What you're saying is really interesting. And I wonder, in your opinion, do you feel like the terminologies we use are shared enough between the two? And obviously this cross cuts beyond, and I think you were right to bring in something like HR and some of these other equally important parts of the organization that also needs to be interwoven into these conversations. But are we speaking on the same language sometimes? And do you feel there are other facets maybe beyond just terminology that can really accelerate, as you say, kind of the way we work together better in the future. Great point. I think often we don't speak the same terminology, which is an issue. Security might mean something to 
the IT team, that means something completely different than an SRM manager or SRM person. And so that's a challenge. Oftentimes we get, and this is just a natural evolution of any organization and profession is that we get too bogged down into our lexicons and our abbreviations. Like we write reports, might abbreviate things and somebody reading it from the outside might say, this is like gibberish half of it. I can't understand what you mean. But I think that's natural and that happens not just for the humanitarian sector. I think it happens like globally in any organization. I think what could be done is I think realizing that simplified language agreed upon definitions of what are objectives and what are terms is something that could be worked on. You could develop, agree upon like what we mean by security and maybe you, do, you add a lot of qualifiers to things. And so I think that's always a challenge, right? And also people being able to t- talk to each other and oftentimes people relate back to their experience, right? That the people who are operating on the ground rely a lot on their experience that somebody who probably sitting back at HQ or even maybe on the national in the capital are not going to have the same experiences. So they can't make the same connections that, that you're trying to make. Or they might, when we talk about technology, oftentimes the best technology breaks in the field. <laughs> and so you're trying to explain, you know, that it might work in this great environment sitting in the capital or in this place, but once it's exposed, you know, to the reality of day-to-day grind and heat or cold or weather or what have you, or slow bandwidth, like it's going to break down and an issue is going to happen when you deploy it and use it. And so then it becomes, okay, then how you translate what happened to, to learn from it. And so I think more and more the ability to train people and not everybody has to be an expert, right? I think that's not the point. We don't want everybody to be an expert in digital security and data protection laws. And they don't need to be the experts on the ethics of humanitarian principles, right? We need them to know these are the humanitarian principles and how they operate. They guide our work, for example. And so the notion is, how do you improve the technical capacity and literacy of most people without necessarily having them be experts, but just be able to do this work safely and be able to communicate with other components of the organization? I would love to, and you did raise this earlier, but this important conversation about humanitarian principles, humanitarian law, and technology, would just love to get your thoughts on that in general. It is increasingly a topic of discussion. Right, we've seen if we move away just for a second from technology, humanitarian principles, I think for decades have been debated. The notion of neutrality continuously is questioned. We different organizations look at humanitarian principles and apply them maybe slightly differently and they kind of look at them. We've had kind of this kind of split in the seventies, right? Like humanitarians ought to be more engaged politically and not just kind of be like silent witnesses, like they actually have to be like advocates. So we have this like split within the humanitarian sector. But I think increasingly we've seen kind of questioning of like neutrality for some, like the ICRC is a, is a prominent, very important principles because it allows them operationally to do work, right? It allows them to be able to, to meet and talk to people and talk to governments, and have access to prison and have access to be able to, to get aid to, to specific areas because they fundamentally hold to the neutrality and operational principles, you know. Right. For other organizations, it might not be the same thing. And so before we put on like the lens of technology and how technology plays out, fundamentally the principles are continually debated. People talk about whether we need to kind of establish new principles or do all the things. And, and for me, I think the principles work. And I think it's more of operational like neutrality is 100%, I think, an operational, in my mind, principle. And impartiality, I think, is unquestionable. And when we think about technology, what I often go back to now is just no sort of humanity. That we can't forget about, like they're actually humans that we're working with and we're talking to and working with and for. And I think the notion of technology can sometimes warp our image, right? We become focused on statistics, right? Five hundred thousand people or fifty thousand people have died in in Turkey. We kind of take the abstract because of an earthquake, but it's actually fifty thousand individual person and individual people. And technology sometimes warp our, our image. And I think that for me, when I think about what are the dangers to take the, the principles. I think like humanity is the biggest one, right? Like there are other like operational concerns about the other ones, but for me, it's humanity. Can't forget that there's people because it's very easy to get just lost in, in numbers and data and technology allows us to do this. It allows us also, you know, to be separated from the ground, from the reality of what's happening, right? Like it's great. We're sitting in different offices around the world talking right now. Technology is wonderful, but we're not having particularly maybe like the same level of interaction we'd have in person. So I think when we think about the principles, and how they relate to kind of a digital world is fundamentally going to be kind of, you know, adding a new layer of, of concern, right? Like when we think about independence, you know, independence has often been thinking thought about, you know, as a relationship between organizations and the, and the state. Well, today we have to think about organizations and the private tech sector because they're the ones who provide quite a lot, if not most of our software and hardware. 
and they're an incredible agent in kind of the work that humanitarians do. We can talk to them about as like service providers, we can talk about partners. Mm -hmm. They're huge in our work. And so do we have to rethink independence as a principle now as it relates to the private sector? Maybe. I think that that's a source of conversation. We might have talked about this in the past, but I think we've seen increasing kind of this interest in developing these digital emblems for humanitarians, kind of like mimicking like the way we have like the ICRC emblem or the Red Cross emblem or other ways that humanitarians in the physical realm make themselves present that, you know, this is a humanitarian or aid person or entity or facility. Well, a lot of our work is happening right digitally, and we've had a lot of concerns and we've seen over the last couple of years, you know, increasing the humanitarians being targeted digitally as well, right? Databases of humanitarian organizations being hacked, systems being compromised, increasing kind of surveillance of humanitarians and their work happening online. And so there's this incredible push increasingly by, by the ICRC and, and primarily, or at least kind of as the leader of this kind of conversation, of this notion of could we kind of create a digital cyber copy of kind of our approach to physical emblems and all the protection that it provides so that we can then say, well, you know, this is a humanitarian server, humanitarian database, not a target. Kind of sad that we have to do this, right? It should be like plain sight that this is humanitarian, I'm not a target. Whether it's physically mm-hmm. or digitally, it should be the case. But it's harder in some cases because oftentimes we're using technologies that get used by potentially the military and governments who in some cases could be under IHL, like legitimate targets. But then also there's still kind of the same infrastructure that sometimes humanitarians use. And so, you know, there might be a military necessity to target server or some installation or some like cyber installation but it might have complete repercussions on the way humanitarians deliver aid. I'm not an IH, I'm not an international law professional or like lawyer. So I can't like tell you like, well, yes, this still kind of qualifies or not, but I think it's open to it's an important discussion to have. And so I think IHL and, and is, is something that more and more conversations are happening. There is kind of in part of the work of humanitarians, there's this notion of like, a, do we need a digital Geneva convention? And I got pushed back, I think one time from an ICRC person, very rightfully, it says, you know, well, the Geneva Conventions also apply. Like, they apply digitally. Mm-hmm. It's not just... But I think there's an emphasis, I think, or a push from humanitarians to re-clarify. We're not just talking about the physical world. We're talking about the digital and the cyber realm and protections apply there, too. Maybe we just need to clarify it better. That is very interesting. And I think that in itself is, a, you said, a, a very important and deeper conversation to continue to explore. And I'm just wondering, I mean, you've shared so much interesting facets for us to really think through. And something I know that you said, and I just want to maybe go there briefly, which is, I know you said technology is a tool, not a solution. And it's humans helping humans. And I think that is very well said. and. Just take us to that concept, which I I hear us talking through today and share with us, are there things that we should zone in further on, given everything you've shared? Are there some more considerations that we need to be thinking about to make sure that we understand where technology fits at the intersection of humanitarian work, but also security risk management and the most important element, which is the everyday human? I'll start off by saying that in one of my dissertation work, I had a conversation with a private sector person who worked with the humanitarians. They put it, I think, very nicely. And that's what's been stuck with, my, with me for, for a long time is that technology is a tool. The cloud is never going to feed a, a hungry child. It's not going to protect humanitarian hospital. It's not going to do all those things. At the end of the line, it's humans helping humans. But what can t- technology do is that It could increase our ability and our impact Could provide more opportunities for humans to improve, to increase their impact. And I think that for me has been stuck in my head as I do more and more work on technology and how we can use it in our field and and do it in a way that is safe. But to build on kind of what are the opportunities? And I think I always go back to what is the problem we're trying to solve? And I think that is fundamentally, and, and might seem like simple, but I feel like oftentimes we flip the question. We don't think about what is the problem we're trying to solve. Like, what are the roots of the issue, right? If I put my PhD in conflict resolution hat on, we always start with conflict map. We always design these, like, brilliant, expansive maps. Like, these are the issues. These are the symptoms of the problem. These are the roots of the issue. These are kind of, like, where they come from, different actors involved. And oftentimes, we just think of it as, well, here's the technology. How do I apply it? Or oftentimes, like, we get rushed into, like, not to throw, like, a lot of people under the bus nowadays, but, like, we get, get very excited about technologies like chat GPT. And say, oh man, it's going to change the way humanitarians do work or change the world. And, and, you know, maybe it will. Who knows? 
you know, people have been saying the same about Bitcoin for a decade and it, or, or cryptocurrencies. Who knows, right? Like, it take, like societies don't change that quickly or like, you know, there's a slow path. And oftentimes, unfortunately, more often than not in the humanitarian sector, there's more examples of innovations failing than succeeding. And so going back to this notion, okay, what is the problem we're trying to solve? The way to realize this is to understand the problem is to talk to people, is to be able to understand the, the environment. The best thing we can do as humanitarians, people who care, is listen, really listen, and engage the people whose lives are most impacted by whether it's the conflict, whether it's disaster, whether it's lack of economic development, whatever the issue is, listen to the people, get them involved from the get-go. You care about this country, you care about working in this place, you want to do good, that's all fine and well. But if we don't engage, if we don't kind of use the buzzword of like the humanitarian sector, like if we don't localize and if we don't have this localization, then all of this is, is a little bit, in a way, a little bit maybe meaningless. So we got to start off by engaging the people whose lives are mostly impacted by this, the people who know better, the people who have the local knowledge, the local relationships. It's going back to acceptance, right? We need the local relationships often to operate. And then we think about, okay, like these are the issues. We know these are what the symptoms look like of this issue. We know kind of the root causes. What can we do, right? Oftentimes it might not be a technology uh, issue. It might be a governance issue. It might be an education issue, whatever it might be. But then we can think about, okay, well, how can technology help us either solve this issue or help us engage in this issue differently or look for new approaches. And I think that is a much more comprehensive and I think a better way of approaching a lot of the work that we do. And I realize oftentimes we're much more short-term focused and that's fundamentally kind of like the sin of humanitarian action is that we always think about, well, this crisis happened. We got to respond. We got to do this. We got to like, and we don't often spend the time to kind of think long-term Primarily, you know, we have funding constraints and government and mandates from organizations that don't necessarily allow it. So we have to kind of flip. We have to be able to build these relationships and think a little bit more long term. I think we talked previously is like the notion of like anticipatory action and kind of having more conversations and thinking about, well, these are things that could trigger more conflict or more violence or more disasters. How do we do something about it to be more preventive? It's interesting what you're saying because I think of nexus issues and where the intersection goes. And I think sometimes we use the term humanitarian all encompassing to mean what we do. And that's okay. But just spitting off a little bit on your comment about going long term and the need to look longer term, you know, when you look at the intersection of nexus issues, where is technology's role in influencing, particularly when you referenced earlier, a lot of innovations tend to happen in these crisis moments. So what about, like you said, the long term, the longer development thinking, the more advocacy, yeah. human rights conversation, where are these kind of nexus issues aligning us in this technology conversation? That's an issue. And I think it's a very complicated proposition. And again, maybe I'll split it off. Like I think from a peace building still kind of also developing its own relationship to technology, but maybe to focus on humanitarian development answer is one of the things that come back is, by lack of a better term, what most often needed is less so like capacity building, right? Like people in a lot of places have knowledge about technology. What's needed is kind of support and not coming in and necessarily like assuming that, you know, they've not seen a computer before or, or that they, you know, in often places where unfortunately a lot of disasters and the conflict happen, you know, they have better like, e-mobile, e-banking or mobile banking systems that we have here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so what's often needed is kind of more humility from us to think of these issues. What we ought to think of us also is for long term is how do we help? What is our role as kind of these international partners, international institutions? How do we help local organizations or national organizations build up their systems, potentially have more sustainability in their approach? One of the things that kept coming up in, in some of the interviews that I've done is that unfortunately a lot of times national governments will offer an international, like private, com like an international person or international private tech company versus like a local one because they just assume that international all is better than local. And so one of the things that we can do with the international community or kind of international orgs is, is how do you change that model? How do you change kind of the perceptions? Is it like credential? Is it like how do you partner more with local organizations so that their own national institutions will, will go for them rather than go for like, you know, the Microsoft of the world. So how do that, that's, I think one of the things that we can, we ought to be doing and thinking about long term, because that's how we really then move away from like this notion of like 
a Toronto actor comes in every time to, to do something. And then it becomes more about we're able to lo- build local capacities and improve kind of the reputation and help maybe like it's kind of the financing. And then that helps us also be able to kind of build for long term because they're the ones who will stay there for years, unlike humanitarians who come in for four to eight weeks and leave. But also I think this notion and of got to think long term, there are things we can do, right? We, we can develop partnerships with people so that we know when a disaster hits, like who to respond to, who to connect with. We can predict technology allows us, for example, in some cases when it comes to flooding, the famine, potentially tracking of like drought. We're able to kind of predict some of this stuff like three, six, nine months ahead of time. What's often lacking is kind of this infrastructure for response. And so what happens is that we kind of wait too long and then the famine happens and it's like, well, now we're rushing to provide like food parcels or something to minimize the harm rather than say, well, we knew that this was going to happen because we knew there was a drought. And when there's droughts, more often than not, that means the agricultural output is going to be lower, you know, in the next six months. So we have to kind of do something about it now. I think a lot of times, you know, technology allows us to not necessarily be able to be 100% like right about predicting, but at least be better at waiting until the disaster happens. And to be fair, I think humanitarians are getting better at this. But I think still early warning is often not linked to early response. We just have early warning and then we're saying, well, look at this. This happened nine months later. Great. Who knew? Well, like somebody's yelling at a computer. Do you think that collaborating with security and IT on these intersections can maybe help improve that? Yeah, for sure. That's where I think collaborations comes into play because they're the people who oftentimes have this mindset, especially I think the security folks oftentimes are the ones who also think about, well, we have to think about these things for more long-term purposes or they're more geared for like scenario thinking like if this happens, then we have to do this. Or if this happens, then maybe we respond that way. So I think there's a mentality, I think, of the security folks to the scenario at different situations and build up appropriate mechanisms for response. And I think we need the same model applied to kind of just a general humanitarian and humanitarian nexus. And I want to make also kind of a quick note what we also need is better evidence. We need better evidence about what, what's worked, what hasn't. We need better mechanisms of sharing this knowledge across, not just being siloed within like our own organizations or even our own sectors. I think there's a lot we can learn from a peace builder, a conflict resolution person who spent decades working on negotiation that could help a humanitarian actor negotiate for access or can help a development actor negotiate better with like the private sector for long-term like loans or something. So I think there's this important notion of there's a lot of knowledge that gets generated. We just need to be better at sharing it and be able to better operationalize it into practice. Again, not to offense anybody, but not just build these long lists of indicators, a long list of things that they're great as like evidence of like what's happened in the path of what like the situation is, but like they rarely help us operationalize. Well, we know there's like corruption. Okay. What do we do about it? Like we know there's like all these different economic indicators, human rights indicators, or like humanitarian indicators collect a lot of data in the sector, but oftentimes I think we just collect data for the sake of data. No. And it, we don't really think a lot. Okay. How do we operationalize this? You know, what does this mean for funding purposes? What does this mean for developing a specific uh, program intervention? We're good at collecting things, collecting data. I think we're not as good as operationalizing it. And I think that mm. even with all the technology that we have, it's still something that fundamentally we're not great at. Wow. I think that is a very important point you're making and one that I think many of us will probably have some reflections on, I imagine, and <laughs> be interesting to hear what others have to say about that. And we'd love to stay in touch with you on how you think the sector is doing in response to that, as well as to many of the other things you've really well laid out for us today. I want to give you a moment to just maybe leave us with a couple of tokens from our conversation. And you've shared so many valuable inputs for us to walk away with, but maybe just give us some key essence of what we need to make sure that we you leave us with today. If you think one thing from like this conversation is to be critical about both the impact of potential technologies and, and, and the harms of technology. I think it's important to be Fundamentally, especially as people who are working in security environments, is to be critical in kind of questioning of what the technology is doing or can do to us or for us, actually, too important distinction to us and for us. Because oftentimes when we're critical 
And when we sit back and think about, okay, like, is this the right approach? Is this the right tool? Or is this the right, like, appropriate operationalizing of a specific tool? Then we can realize, well, this is a better way to approach this, or no, we actually shouldn't do it. So I think being critical is important for you as a security risk manager or a humanitarian as you think about technology. The second thing that I would say is make use of your networks, make use of the people that are part of kind of this broader humanitarian sector. I've realized this doing my dissertation work. There's so many people who are willing to talk to you, who are actually eager to talk to you, to have these conversations like we're having today. They're going to be able to help you think about, you know, whatever issue you're having about technology. And if they don't have the right answer, I've come to realize they will know the people to talk to, right? They will tell you, okay, go talk to this person working at this company and they'll connect you, send email. I think we oftentimes operate in silos, not just like within our organizations and all that. We just forget that we're part of this larger ecosystem of people who are expert cryptocurrency that for humanitarian response, or they're experts about physical security training or for like people going into the civil war stricken countries and, and responding, providing aid. There is the know-how within kind of this broader system of people and, and people. One of my biggest hopes is that we're, we're able to share better and be able to bring people in these settings to talk about these issues, to share and oftentimes I say this is that we don't talk about failure, I think, enough. I think from failure, we can oftentimes learn. And, you know, things don't always work out, and it's fine, but we have to learn. And the only way to learn is to talk to people and to learn from their experience and to connect with them. Mm -hmm. So I think that my second token is talk to people, reach out, and make use of There's a lot of smart, very friendly, very welcoming people that are willing and are there to help. And it's just a matter of sending an email. Or tweeting at them. <laughs> that is absolutely wonderful. I know that, you know, you've been a great resource and help to GISF and definitely agree with your reflections. We just really want to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we'll make sure that some of the resources you, you've been a part of and any others that you'd like us to share will be part of the, the resources in the episode as well. Thank you so much for being with us. And we look forward to continuing this conversation ahead. Thank you so much, Tara. The Global Interagency Security Forum is a member-led NGO with a global network of over 140 member organizations and affiliates. We are committed to achieving sustainable access for populations in need through improved safety and security for aid workers and operations. GISF's original research, collaboration, and events drive positive change in security risk management across the humanitarian and development sector. We operate according to humanitarian principles and lead on best practices and innovation by pushing for a collaborative and inclusive approach to security risk management. The people doing the world's most important work are up against the biggest challenges. Since the 90s, security incidents involving NGOs have increased as their independence and impartiality no longer protect them. Humanitarians are actively targeted, as well as exposed to the risks of conflict and disaster, facing kidnapping, injury, and death in order to help those in need. And the threats to their safety means their ability to help diminishes too. NGOs began to create roles for dedicated security professionals, but they often lacked support and resources and worked in isolation. In 2006, a group of them from the UK and Ireland got together to develop coherent approaches to security risk management in the humanitarian space, eventually becoming an established network, the European Interagency Security Forum. With a strategic, inclusive and collaborative focus, the Forum has created a centre of excellence, facilitates a peer-to-peer -peer network, builds capacity for security risk management and provides a voice for practitioners reaching over a hundred members. In response to growing demand, it has now gone global, bringing different perspectives expertise and resources to make core activities such as original research, trainings, workshops and knowledge sharing more impactful than ever. As a result, 
organizations are able to build their security risk management on an even stronger foundation to keep more aid workers safe and enable sustainable access to communities in need. With a vision to see the work of the whole third sector done more effectively by supporting NGOs around the world, we are the Global Interagency Security Forum.